Welcome back to Rink Wrap, presented by Forever Blue Shirts. I am Jim Cerny, and that is Don LaGreca. Familiar face, familiar <laughs> to the podcast, and certainly familiar to Ranger fans all around. Donnie, thanks for a few minutes today. Always a pleasure, man. How you doing? I, great. I, I think we did a longer, longer, better version of this podcast that wasn't recorded right before we started. So <laughs> yeah, we, really really set, stuff, yeah. we really set the bar Pretty high cool. before actually recording something here. Um, it, this this is a weird thing. I got this question asked the other day. I, I was telling you I'm doing some play-by-play, -play, Hudson Valley mm -hmm. Venom, minor league hockey and all that. Some Ranger fans were at a game. And they started peppering me with questions about, well, you were on the team a lot, you know, years, decades, covering the team, working for the team. You know, who were your favorite guys? Like, not, not just who were the best players, but who were your favorite guys that you were around? And all of a sudden, I found myself pulling out names like Michelle Petit, Anton Strawman, <laughs> uh, you know, guys that you just become close to for whatever reason. They're just good dudes or whatever. Uh, you know, maybe they're reliable post game, you know, that you can go to them. They'll give you a good assessment of a game. Dan Boyle made my list as well. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't tell Brooksy. Um, you know, whatever. I, I was trying to come up with these different guys that the, weren't the obvious. Oh, Mike Richter was a gem. Henrik Lundqvist is a prince, you know, on down the line. So anyway, it's a big wind up to a question before we delve into this year's team. Mm -hmm. Like, who are your, some of your top three, top five guys just to deal with, just as guys from being around the Rangers as long as you have? Well, um, there's a few. One, one, one is, is kind of, it, it, it was kind of cheating because I had known him before he became a Ranger with Scott Gomez because I got to know him when he was a devil and he used to actually call into my Saturday show when I first started at ESPN because the thing about Gomer is anything but hockey. Like, he was interested in talking about anything but hockey. The second you start talking about hockey, his eyes would roll in the back of his head and he'd fall asleep. But he started talking about, you know, the, his, his, he was a San Diego Charger fan and he loved baseball. And um, so when he became a Ranger, it was just, like, perfect. Like, he was my go-to guy to just talk sports with. And he, was, he wasn't there long, but he was a really good guy. The other one is Marty Biron. Biron was just such a gem. Like, he was... Talk about anything. He was also a guy that listened to the K show. He's also a big sports fan, but he, he was. And then during the playoffs, I would be at ice level. So I'd be alongside the Rangers bench and he'd always be tapping his stick on the glass to get my attention. Like he was just a really fun guy. Yeah. And I'm really glad that he's doing well in the business. And whenever I, you know, see him up in Buffalo, we cross paths wherever. It's always good to talk to him. Brian Boyle's another guy. That was just really easy to talk to, um, fun. So th those are the guys that pop into my head. Another one that you're going to be surprised because he doesn't say boo now as the general manager of the team, but I always got along with Chris Drury yeah. because even though I'm a Met fan, knowing I was working on the Michael K show, you know, he always would ask me Yankee questions and, yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and then he just decided he was a Yankee fan. So this is a couple of years ago was uh, Yankees won on opening day and, it was it was the um the the there wasn't a playoff series against the Devils, but they were playing the Devils late in the season at the Rock. So I was doing the play by play. I was walking to the bathroom, and Chris from behind's like, "Oh, we we got him today." And my first thought is, "Well, it's it's you're you're losing two nothing in the first. What is he talking about? He was talking about the Yankees." And like, and so yeah, those are the guys that kind of pop into my, my head. It's just uh, yeah, listen, hockey players are all fantastic. You know that. I yeah. can count on one hand the real pieces of crap that you'd had to deal with. Seriously. Right. In yeah, baseball, you can count on one hand the good guys. You know, football, the, but in hockey, it's reverse. You can count on one hand the guys that weren't that great, but the guys that were super were just so many. Yeah, they, and it should, it's very interesting that you mentioned Drew because I got along great with him as a player. He never really said anything, but he was mm -hmm. always fun off camera, off mic and everything. But since becoming GM, total shutdown. Yeah, it's uh, I yeah. It was every once in a while. He he. And, and the other thing I'll never forget too was when uh, I was in the hospital with COVID. Uh, um, I I ended up getting you know, COVID pneumonia. I was fine. All right, so there was no you know making peace with God moment. I just unfortunately had to go to the hospital, 
and he texted me, asked how I was doing. Like, I, he's a, he's a really, really good guy, but I do think as general man, he's all business, you know, he's all about winning and, yeah. and that's why he won in little league. That's why he won in the NHL and he's trying to get the Rangers on the right spot. So now it's kind of a, you know, it's a little awkward that way, but when he was a player, it was, it was really easy to talk to. Yeah. He, just because you mentioned Chris Jury, it takes me off on a tangent. How would you grade his first few years? And I know there's been the successes and you know conference finals. I've often made the argument that he's done a lot and had a lot of success with what he inherited. Now he was part of that inheritance because his assistant GM obviously he played a role in helping mm-hmm. build that team. But there's you know Jeff Gordon's fingerprints, John Davidson's fingerprints are all, all over you know this team because. Drury has made the decision to keep it together. Just kind of curious, your your take on on the job uh, his first three plus years. You know what I like about Chris is that um, he admits his mistakes. Like you see, a lot of general managers will double, triple down. You know, he saw that he made a mistake with Gerard Gallant and, and did something about it. And I think it's worked well because when he let Gallant go, I, I raised an eyebrow. I was like, wait, hey, playoffs two years in a row, conference final. Like, what's going on here? Um, but I think he ended up doing the right thing because I think Laviolette's been uh, a great addition. So I think that's what I like about it. I, you know, and also you can look at the draft picks, some his, some not. But I, I think he's done a really good job of balancing a really difficult salary cap, bringing in young players during a time where the team is expected to win. Right. So you're, you're trying to develop young players like Lafreniere and Kako and Miller and Schneider uh, Oh, by the way, don't screw up because these games are important. We're trying to win a Stanley Cup. Like the Devils with their high draft picks with Heashier and Hughes, yeah, go out, have a good time. We don't care. We're not trying to win until, you know, until recently. They they never had that luxury. So to be able to balance the young players, making the right moves, I thought he did a great job at the deadline um, to to bring in the guys he needed to last year. So it's still a work in progress. I know Ranger fans, kind of like Yankee fans, expect will championship or bust because of how good this team has been for the last little while. But I think it's really hard to win. And I think he's got them in a position where there, I think there's only one team that they're going to have trouble getting by. And that's the team that beat him in the conference final. You know, so, um, and I, I think that's, uh, that's a good position for them to be in. So I, I, I would grade him out very high, but ultimately you got to go out there and win. But I, I think he's done a terrific job. Yeah. It, you, it, it's funny how you mentioned you, you you talked about the fans' reaction to the team and, and everything and, and the fine line that a GM has to walk, you know, with this team. I sense so much angst this season from Ranger fans, mm-hmm. so much. Yeah. And, you know, and everyone jumping on Truba's comments about, you know, this might be the last go-round for the core. Well, this might be the last go-round for Truba, you know, here, and Ryan Lindgren maybe. But, you know, not the entire core, you know, they have guys locked into place for a while. Um, But I sense angst among this fan base. Like they're really, really worried and and they're agitated at every little thing. And they're furious at Mika Zibanejad already. And of course, they were already down on Jacob Truba. And he, I mean, do you do you sense the same thing? Do you get the same vibe that I'm getting that everyone seems to be everyone? fan base people right. are just simply on edge about this oh. season more so than in any recent season. Yeah. Because I think uh, obviously they were disappointed with the way it went down against Florida, but I can honestly say, I think the better team won. Uh, but, and, and, and the perception that nothing was done during the off season, they expected them to go out and get a bunch of players, but they, there's cap restrictions. You've got Igor hanging out there. How much you're going to have to pay him? So there's money that you obviously have to, to to save up on. I do think they put themselves in a position that they can make some act moves at the deadline. But you know, Carrick didn't move any needles. Riley Smith didn't move any needles. They wanted them to make a big splash. But I I keep telling Ranger fans, listen, maybe what if Kako grows the way Lafreniere grew last year? What if Lafreniere takes even a bigger step this year? Those are like acquisitions, right? If you keep Philip Heedle healthy all year, he can be a star in this league. So I, I didn't really think there was a lot to be done, right? They lost to a better team in six games. We'll see if Florida can go to a Stanley Cup final a third consecutive year, which is very difficult to do. I know Tampa did it, but it's still a very difficult thing to do. I think that they're in a really good position, but you're right. There's a lot of angst. Truba was hurt last year. I thought he's gotten off to a great start this year. 
But I do think that, you know, there's this expectation that you got to go out there and win the Stanley Cup and you've got to do this and you got to do that. And and I do think the window's kind of closing in the sense that I, I did find it interesting. Laviolette got a three year contract. It's almost like, all right, you got three years now to get this done. So, yeah, they're locked in long term. But as far as being a real legitimate cup champion, do I see it beyond the next couple of years? I don't know. But I do think that they're still in their wheelhouse of getting this done. But do I, I do sense the angst. I, I, I think it's ill-placed, but it comes from a place that, hey, 94 was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, and yeah, and look how long you had to wait before 94. So, yeah. you know, one championship in what has it been, 80-plus years, I can kind of understand where they're coming from. Yeah, for sure. It, you, you know what? It, it's interesting, too. I was thinking this is taking a walk along the Hudson this morning. I'm walking my dog and – you know, thinking about this interview, thinking about Rangers, because this is what I do, think about the Mets. And I, I I was thinking about the Mets and the Rangers. And, you know, the Rangers, obviously, a few years ahead of, mm-hmm. you know, where the Mets are in their development. And just how how much fun 2024 run was and getting into the playoffs, The you know, the day, literally the day after the season ended. Mm-hmm. And, and then everything that happened after that, it was just this magical great fun run and it won't be that way in 2025 nope and the angst is going to build and the anger is going to build among the Mm -hmm. fan base and even if they win a world series of course it'll be a big deal let's say they win a world series in 26 27 but the pressure that builds after you do that initial breakthrough it, it made me think of 21 22 and that that playoff run in 22 for the rangers and it was all, oh, the kids, the kid line, then, oh, look at Igor, and he's winning the Vezina, and, you know, Fox is a year removed from winning the Nars, and it's going to be like this forever, mm. you know? And no, it's not. And no, and no you're going to be angry, and they're going to make the conference final again, and you're st- you as a Ranger fan, you're going to be pissed off again, you know, because, oh, we didn't win again. And it, there's that innocence of the first run, and then after that, it's almost like it's almost like drudgery. It's like I know. yes, there's but, success, but there's this drudgery that goes along with it, you know? Yeah, but but you also had to see through 22 for what it was. And that was a really nice run. But I I didn't think they were the fourth best team in the NHL. They could have no, lost no. to Pittsburgh in the first round. You could right. make the case they should have lost to Pittsburgh in the first round. Uh, the hit, as legal as it was on Crosby by Truba. Changed that series. Changed everything. If, if 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 Crosby's healthy, they lose in the first round, and nobody's raising their eyebrows that they let Gallant go after getting bounced in the first round by the Devils. And let's face it, they got Carolina's number. They just do. So now they find themselves in the conference final. They're up two games to none with a two nothing lead in game three, and the perception is we're close. But really, how close were they, Jim? And and then you learn from losing against New Jersey. Now I think this team, like I thought they were legit. They won the President's Trophy. They were legitimately one of the best teams in the NHL. They just caught a juggernaut in Florida. Um, and now I think you're right. But now the angst is, okay, and there's no more miracle runs. They're, now it's just business. It's all business. Right. They swept Washington. It was all business. I couldn't believe the panic. When they had to play a game six against Carolina, it was like, oh, my yeah. God, we're going to blow this series. And everything. And that yeah. was an amazing way that they won those games. But, you know, and then obviously what happened with Florida. Hey, listen, they could have very easily gotten swept in that series. Right. I mean, they got they came up with some big goals in overtime and it was fun. But, but you're right now. It's just all business and it takes some of the fun out of it. Right. Because now it's like everything's like big yawn until we get to not even April. Now it's a big yawn till we get to late May. Right. And there's a lot of hockey to be played between now and then. Right. Did you see, I don't know if you saw it, uh, Mika post game the other night, he was being asked about, he was asked like eight questions about the, oh, you know, the change of line combinations. You're not playing with Kreider. You're playing with Panarin and Lafreniere. And, and you know, Mika. Mika's about as low key, right. you know, that, that pulse rate is is just a step above death basically <laughs> right? yeah you know? yeah i mean he is just he's so low-key and answering it and and he's very careful with his words and everything and then about the fifth question or so he he said it was kind of with the smirk he he goes and i'm paraphrasing here 
you know, at the at the time of the changes, we're seven, two, and one, and we're changing our lines and we're trying to get better. We believe we can be better, and we're seven, two, and one. There are worse problems we could have. <laughs> right. You know, and then he kind of laughed a little bit. And, you know, I know some people were put off by that, you know. Oh, you're mocking it. We're seven, two, and one. But but look at how we played in the de the, uh, the defensive play, the defensive zone play. We're relying on Igor. You know, da 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 da. And I believe some of that. But it was interesting to get a player perspective where he just seemed like, all right, enough. Listen, of course we want to be better. We know we can be better. But hey, we're seven, two, and one. Yeah, you know, better to be in this spot than to be. Well you know, whatever, three, six, and one, and trying to figure out how to get better. Right, right. And, and listen, I'm not going to tell you that the regular season doesn't mean anything because we see it does. Good teams don't make the playoffs. I mean, when you take a look at other sports, you know, 16 out of 32 is not bad compared to the 20 out of 30 that make it in the NBA. And even baseball now, 12 out of 30. Football, 14 out of 32. It's tough to make the playoffs. But we're also in a world where Edmonton fired their coach in November last year, and they make it to Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final. we got to relax, all right? You're not going to look like a championship team every year. So so Winnipeg's going to win the Stanley Cup? They've won 10 of their first 11. I mean, uh, what, what kind of odds are you going to get on them winning the Stanley Cup? Probably not very good because it's just an 11-game sample. We, You just don't want to dig yourself too big of a hole. I understand panic go starting 0-4 in Nashville. I can understand some panic in Colorado where the team hasn't yet gotten any traction yet. But when you're when you know you're a playoff team, I'm sorry, you're not going to look like the 84 Oilers every single night. You're just not. Um, and I do think some things to get cleaned up. Igor really saved their bacon in 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 the last couple of wins. And, and certainly I thought, uh, you know, over the last four going into the game on Sunday, they were very average, you know, around 40 shots a game, scoring two goals a game. But still finding a way to win. Everything's okay, as Kevin, as Kevin Bacon said in Animal House. All is well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> always, always willing to quote the geniuses, Don LaGreca. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> my geniuses, anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, so when you watch the game against Florida, and you could argue after that, you know, Washington, there were some similar issues. Mm -hmm. Ottawa, similar issues. Even against the Islanders, five on five, you could argue there were a lot of the similar issues, just not as many, maybe not as many uh, glaring. But going back to the Florida game, though, I think that's where the panic started to, to rise up. Because I'll admit, I watched it and I replayed the game and I watched it again to make sure before I you know, wrote things and put opinions out there. I'm like, did I see what I th thought I saw? What I thought I saw was a lot of deja vu Mm. of what I saw in the spring. And that was without Barkov in the yeah. lineup. That is with a completely restructured bottom six. But they just, they, it was it was the same script. This is how you're going to beat the New York Rangers. This is how we play. We're going to dictate this game. They did not allow the Rangers to dictate how the game was played. Nope. And they just, they, they won a vast majority of those puck battles. You know, the puck possession, it was just so in their favor. I'm like, no, I watched it once, but watch it again. Nope. That's exactly what I no. saw last spring. Did you feel the same way? And if you do, if you do feel the same way, how big a concern is this move well, for this team? Well, I, well, the one thing I will say, though, is I thought Bobrovsky played very well in that game. Great. So, he was yeah, terrific. So you know, so they did get their share of opportunities. Bobrovsky had to be great first star, I believe, for them to be able to win the game with yep. three one. So hey, it's one, it's it's one meeting. But I I did feel like going into that, this was a measuring stick game. That this was all right, first meeting between the team you're going to have to beat, and you get beat in your own building. And as you said, Barkoff, who you know, let's face it, is a, is, a, is a superstar and really very good at what Florida does out of the lineup. So little little disturbing. Hey. That they're they're gonna have two more chances, but does it mean that by the time we get to possibly meeting them again, that things can't change? I think the way Florida plays, Jim, is very hard to play every single night. I think it's gonna be very difficult for them to be able to repeat that because of that. Right. For years in a row, because yeah, right. they pretty much played from game one through game a hundred, whatever it was when the playoffs were over. 
they stuck to that style last year. And now to do that is second straight season. It's going to be hard. Boy. Yeah. But there, there's a, the reason I don't get too caught up in it is because Florida may not be there. <laughs> you know, if the Rangers don't mind their P's and Q's, it could be somebody else that picks them off. So I get it. I get a little crazy about building teams to beat one team. You've got to beat a bunch of teams, and maybe Florida will be there in the conference final. Maybe not. Um, I'd still bank on it because I, I don't know about Toronto. Boston's taking a step back, and I like Tampa, but I'm not in love with Tampa. So I, I would probably bet that Florida will still be there. But, you know, who's hurt? You know, who's not playing well? Like, there's a lot of things to go into it. But, yeah, for one small sample size, I saw – kind of what I saw for six games back in late May. But as far as being disturbed by an October loss, I mean, a lot's going to happen between now and then. Maybe a different team. Who knows who they'll pick up at the deadline that might change the perspective of that. Um, so uh, it, it, it raised an eyebrow, I'll say that. You know what I find, too, with the early season schedule? As you know, Mika was pointing out, we're 7-2-1. and one, Now they're 8-2-1. and one. There just aren't a lot of good teams in the NHL. I mean, really good teams because the Rangers are a really good team. They're one of the best teams in the league. So mm-hmm. who's in that echelon with them? There are not a lot. And when they did play teams that you could argue good teams, Florida, all right, didn't go so well. Now, Washington, I wouldn't call an upper echelon team, but they're off to a really good start. Really good start. Really good hockey. Mm-hmm. And that that was as ugly as it got this season for the Rangers. But there haven't been, you know, there's a bunch of Detroit twice, you know, now we got Detroit again this week, Buffalo. But it seems to be that if you're a team on the Rangers level, if you're the Rangers, you're the Panthers, who else you want to throw in that mix? Vegas, you know, the the real upper echelon teams in the league. You don't really, really get to test yourself against the elite too often over the course of a season. Because I, I see the league as, there's this massive, I'm trying to get my hands in the camera, yeah. this massive well, bunch of teams that are all the same. It's it's that that dream of parity, you know, right. getting yeah. everyone together. And then and then there's about that many teams at the very, very bottom that are just, you know, no good. And this many teams at the top. So it, I think it's really hard in a way to get a feel of how you stack up against the other really great teams. Because yeah. if you're the Rangers and you're rolling through the Sabres and the Red Wing, well, you should be. You you should be beating those teams. And on an odd night, you'll lose here and there. But you know you do not get to challenge yourself that often. I look at the schedule this month. Where are the main challenges? They got Carolina and, and Winnipeg on their schedule this month in a busy 14, 15 game month. You right. know, two games where I circle them and say, yeah, all right, well, those are tests. Yeah, there's not many. Uh, you're right, because I can't put Winnipeg as upper echelon. They're playing like it, but I don't know. Right. They don't have the – listen, they're, they're a playoff team. They're a good team, but I, I don't know if they're upper – here are the upper echelon teams to me. Florida, Rangers, Dallas, Vegas. That I, really, I I'm really hard pressed to say who else, especially in the Eastern Conference. I mean, it's Tampa. I mean, I know Tampa's playing well; they're exceptionally well coached. But you know, they, a lot is left over the last few years. I, I can't put them as an upper echelon team. Carolina, I I still might have them in the conversation, Jim, because I think Brenda Moore is a tremendous coach. But a lot's left, and and the Rangers have their number, and they haven't accomplished anything either. They. You know, they're, they're a team that can threaten to win the division, but you would know, have that one conference final appearance. Otherwise, they haven't really made any runs. I, I You're right. So there's really not that many teams where, oh, that's a, that, there's teams that are playing well. Now, I will say this, though. If you go back to last year, I was really impressed that the Rangers swept Boston. But now, as it turned out, it, was, it didn't seem that right now it didn't age well. But at the time, I'm thinking, well, Boston's really good, and they seem to own Boston. Like, can that happen to Florida that we're going to look back and go, eh, maybe Florida didn't turn out to be all that good. But but right now, yeah, it's Florida. It's, it's it, you know, you can't put Toronto in there. I, I can't put New Jersey in there yet. I mean, I need to see it to believe it. You know, at times they can play well. They're not – right now I don't think they're an elite team. So you're right. You got 32 teams in the league. There's probably four teams that are really, really good. Two of them are in a conference where, you know, you, you hardly play them. You play them twice. So, yeah, there's not a lot where you really feel 
tested. So you're kind of almost competing against yourself, right? Like, what do you believe you are? And do you go out there and for 60 minutes prove that you are as good as you say you are? Right. But that's kind of really your only competition is yourself. Right. All right. I know we got to let, let you run in a minute. So real, real quick take. Uh, every guest that comes on, we got to ask this question. Okay. At the end, when it's all said and done, the numbers for Igor are. And I'm assuming you think it's with the Rangers. It's with the Rangers. And it's going to be, he wants 12. It's going to be 12. Right. I mean, that's what it's going to probably be. So what, what does that end up being? Is it, is it seven years? Is it the eight? Yeah, it'd probably it, be eight. Eight. You know, so yeah, it's going to be eight for 12. So whatever that math is. So, I think. but what if, mm -hmm. and we don't know this and, and right. And, and good job, Igor's representatives, they keep it quiet. You know, Chris Jury's got it on lockdown and everything. But there have been reports that that he wants a certain percentage of what the cap's going to be, which would push this more towards 12 and a half, 13. Hmm. And certainly, he's made the case for 12, 12 and a half, 13. Yeah, he's, he's pretty much showing that he might be worth it. But is there any, any argument out there that it starts to get too much because we the Rangers are right up against that cap next year. They're gonna have to make some very difficult decisions I know. on other guys. Here's here's the thing. This is where he kind of loses, loses me just a little bit. I know, but I know it's all about time. time. What is Vasilevsky, Vasilevsky like, what? like what nine and a half? Yeah. Bobrovsky's what 10? Now that's all when they came up in free agency. It's kind of like quarterbacks in the NFL, where right. it's just it's it not just that you're the best, climbing. that's when you become a free agent and when you make it, but Here's the thing. Vasilevsky, they gave him the money. They win two cups. Bobrovsky, highly paid. They just won the cup. Aiden but Hill has a cup, right? Darcy Kemper has a cup. Like, so what is the formula? The formula is if you're going to, if you're going to let Igor go, you better make sure that you've got up in front of your goaltender, elite players like Colorado had when they won the cup. Like, like they, you know, I wouldn't say Vegas had elite players, but exceptionally deep. They've always been a really deep team. So what's the formula, uh, Jim? Is it is it uh, any goaltender can win with this team, or is it I need my goaltender to steal it? And uh, we had Henrik Lundqvist on the K show, and he said, "What, what goaltenders don't get paid for cups; they get paid for consistency." Hmm. And I thought that was interesting uh, because if you're thinking it that way, it's like, yeah, Igor is gonna that that box is gonna be checked for the length of the contract, right? That the, the when the, when the Rangers had Lundqvist, they knew the one problem we don't have is in goal. Like that's a yep. nice problem to have solved. So, but at the same time, even though the cap's likely going to go up you know, significantly, possibly, you got to be able to have guys in front of you. You just do, you know, and Hank never won. I mean, Hank's going to go to the hall. Of, he's going to waltz into the hall of fame as the greatest goaltender the Rangers have ever had. And he's got one Stanley cup final appearance and no cups, you know, so he's got to be careful, man. Good for you. Get what you can get. Get your bag, as they say, but uh, it can't come at the expense of having bushers in front of them that aren't going to be able to get the job done. So they've got some very difficult. I don't envy Chris Drury. This is going to be a very, very difficult decision. Yeah. So, so good on Igor. Get what you can get, man. But you also want to make sure you got a chance to win while you're making all that money. Right. I'm sure we'll revisit Igor yeah. and you know everything else. You know, contracts for next season and you know how they structured this team and you know trade deadline all that when we bring you at, when we bring you back again multiple times yeah, so yeah, this well. season because i don't know for you but certainly for me this this is a lot of fun this is like us years ago just sitting around forget the microphones just sitting around talking hockey and i i love it so no listen this is always it. so much fun man i've known you for years and god i've known you for over 30 years so met you in 1992 there's probably a lot of people watching this that you know, their parents weren't, weren't married yet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's rough. That's rough right there. Yes, it is. But I uh, really appreciate your time today. And everyone, of course, should catch you on the Michael K Show, which should be renamed the Don LaGreca Show. Thank you. I appreciate but I've been on this soapbox for a long time. But you know where I stand. Um, but everyone can catch you there. And, of course, on the Ranger broadcasts as Thanks, well. Thanks, man. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Take care. It.